Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today, Pete Newell. Pete is the founder and CEO of BMNT, which he started together with Steve Blank, one of our previous podcast guests. And I'm thrilled to talk with him today about how you align innovation strategy and operations in large organizations. Pete, it's wonderful having you here. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So for people who don't know about you and the work that you've done around innovation, can you give us a very brief background as to your journey, where you got started and where you are now? Sure. I'm probably the most least likely um, participant in the innovation space. I mean, I I spent 30 years in the military and largely as as an infantryman, as a tactical officer, uh, multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan and the Balkans. innovation isn't something I really gave a lot of thought to. I, I consider myself a MacGyver. I've always been able to find a way around problems and have always been attracted to that space. So it wasn't until I got the last job of my career, um, I was handed the, the keys to the U.S. Army's Skunk Works, an organization called the Rapid Equipping Force, and you know, given a large budget and the freedom to go find problems on the battlefield and and rapidly find commercial technologies that might solve those issues. Uh, but I spent three years in that job and really got addicted to it. Um, but as part of that, that process, I discovered um, the lack of a, a great framework for very quickly finding problems on the battlefield and articulating them in a language that was readily understood by a wider group of people outside the military that would allow you to recruit people and energize them to take action against the problem and very quickly return a solution to the battlefield. So there was a significant shortcoming in the military in how we do that interact with commercial agencies. So when I retired, I decided that I was gonna build a company that would specialize in helping defense organizations do that. I know that a lot of people uh, think that the military is all about order and management. And I do remember from my previous time as a program manager uh, in the UK, we had a lot of ex-military members there. Um, How do you see this relationship between the order in the military and the need to continuously be innovating? Well, you know, it's interesting, depending on where you're at in the military. You know, for instance, I've been a battalion or a brigade commander deployed in combat in you know, very large organizations and but i found that generally when you go to combat you're um, um not properly trained not properly manned not properly equipped and and all of the things you thought were going to happen never happen and something like so you, you're constantly in a crisis mode of um of finding new ways to do things and solve a problem with the wrong people, wrong equipment, and wrong training, but you manage to get through it anyway. So there's a certain degree of chaos at the forward edge of the battlefield. And then as you drift further back into, you know, the, the larger army into the enterprise, uh, order starts to take control. And you start talking about efficiency of spending dollars versus saving lives. Yeah, and, and there's this really interesting conflict, even within the organization, that constant friction between the two. When you're not at war, the enterprise efficiency folks take over. And when a war starts, slowly the folks in the chaos take over. And, and they're constantly switching back and forth. The, the challenge we find in you know, the modern era is that uh, the flash to bang time, but the cycle speed of of new things happening on the battlefield and suddenly being really catastrophic events is much faster than it ever used to be. And that's causing even more friction in the larger portion of the army. 
and I'm sure there's a lot of parallels between those conflicts um, and the conflicts that happen in organizations when they're trying to figure out, okay, if we have these limited resources, how should we allocate them towards innovation? Sure. Um, and I think that's the, some of the biggest challenges is so many organizations suffer from what I call innovation exhaustion uh, because they've, they've thrown money and human capital at a variety of activities without actually understanding how to take the value from one activity and move it to the next activity and move it to the next activity and actually to, to create a pipeline of innovation within the organization. So oftentimes they're stuck with the collateral of a one-time event that really doesn't translate well to the rest of the organization. And that's what led us to, to, to the creation of a framework or an innovation pipeline that really applies to everybody. I think when a lot of people hear about an innovation pipeline, what they actually think about is an idea collection system. So you talk about getting lots of ideas into a pipeline and then seeing what fits. What, what do you talk about when you're talking about an innovation pipeline? You know, it, actually, that's true. And, and actually, the other thing that happens, people think of, well, I only look at the part of the pipeline where something comes out the other end. And, and um, they're both right and they're both wrong. Um, we see the innovation pipeline essentially as a five-phase process. As you indicated, it starts with how you source ideas and people and problems and technologies that you want to look at and provides you a place where you can set up collisions between people and problems and technologies so that you start to see the formation of, of things that are worth focusing on. For instance, hackathons are great sourcing activities. If they run correctly and you gather the right data from them, they give you a set of really cool people and, and some frameworks and things. That's the first step. The second step is then uh, what we call curation, which is a process of um, if it's a problem focused uh, pipeline is validating that you're actually working on the right problem uh, and providing an opportunity to uh, prioritize the set of problems you have so that you know I'm um, working on the right problem in the right priority. And then finally, ensuring that you have all the tools you need with that to actually be successful if you take it further in the pipeline. So there's a degree of due diligence done in curation that prevents anything that's not ready to be on your platform from getting on the platform and clogging it up and, and wasting time and effort. Um, the next step, discovery, which, which quite frankly is what happened when you bolted, you know, the work I was doing in curation onto Steve Blank and Alex Osterwald's work around customer discovery. But, but that discovery process allows you to, you know, validate the problem and potential solutions and pathways for delivery and actually form a team around something you're gonna deliver. And of course, the next step is taking that team and that idea and putting them into an incubator and turning them into an investable entity, one that can actually deliver a technology solution or a policy solution, one that has a team that can actually scale the delivery of that solution, and one that actually has what I would call first customer, we call it an adoption readiness level, but but actually has a line of customers that are going to take that out of their hands and, and help them build and, and deliver a better product. And then from incubation, you go to the process of transitioning that into, is it a product line? Is it a program or record or something else? But those five phases are, are what we call uh, the innovation pipeline. And we simply have, have uh, returned that H4X, which is essentially uh, the operating system which drives the decisions you make about what moves from one phase to the next is, is the process of due diligence of making innovation happen. I think the, one of the most challenging aspects for a lot of companies is right at the beginning, before you start sourcing ideas, it's understanding the problems and figuring out what problems should actually be uh, invested in, what should be investigated. What's your view on that? Yeah, I, I think that that's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, particularly within the military, we found um, virtually no problem survives first contact when it gets into this curation process. Um, oftentimes, people write problems based on their understanding of the technologies and circumstances around it. And the more you dig into it, you find that most problems presented are actually symptoms of something else. 
you know, if, you, if you're really doing discovery, then eventually you'll find that something else and you'll find the correct problem. The other issue we find a lot is, is people think that problems exist in a vacuum. And, and as we, we encourage them to do discovery around them, we find that in adjacent sectors, um, particularly if it's a government versus commercial sector, that there's virtually no problem that exists in the military that doesn't exist in a commercial sector someplace else. But, but by finding um, multiple versions of the same problem, you start to see the scale of the potential um, adaptation of the solution, but you also see alternative ways of looking at that problem. And that becomes a very rich environment for, for potentially finding solutions. Um, let's, let's talk then about how you bring it all together. Because this pipeline concept, I don't think anyone would disagree that it makes a lot of sense to have a structured way of managing an innovation, uh, sort of having an innovation management process. But what might become challenging is that along that pipeline, you probably need different teams with different skill sets all interacting. What's your experience, sort of how, how does that work and what are the situations when it doesn't work so well? You know, and here's, here's really, it's a little complicated, but, but I'll see if I can um, get through it real quick. Um, between every phase of the pipeline are a set of decisions that certain leaders are making about what transitions from one phase to the next. It's no different than the venture capital folks who are doing due diligence about portfolio companies and the investments they're making. Um, because senior leaders are making decisions about the expenditure of their organization's capital, both in terms of money and in, in human effort. The, the challenge oftentimes is f folks going into an activity haven't identified the data that that activity is going to produce, nor have they identified the analysis that they have to make of that data that will lead to a decision that somebody else is going to make about what transitions to the next step. And oftentimes what happens is the data they gather in the analysis they do is to show you how good that, that activity was. It has nothing to do with what transition to the next activity, which, which is a failure model. Um, so we're very, very deliberate about building the skill sets to look at, at innovation from a data-driven perspective and understanding that um, the decisions you make shouldn't be gut decisions. They actually should be based on um, uh, a disciplined uh, approach of looking at the data. Separately from that, each of those phases, there are activities and methodologies and other things that are particularly well suited for creating the data you need, whether it's Scrum or Agile or Lean or a hackathon or all those things are, are particularly good at, at producing certain data sets that then enabled you to do the analysis that leads to a decision. But, but you have to have that framework in your mind before you commit to doing them, and you have to understand how they relate to one another in order to make the pipeline flow. Um, can you give us some examples about how, sort of what it might actually look like to make that mistake you were talking about, to try and just prove the, the, the current activity rather than whether it, uh, it should go forward so that people can see the mistakes that they might be making? Sure, you know, and I and I don't attack any activity or methodology or other things, but but there are plenty of organizations out there that, when you go in and, and you know there's an innovation team, and they're running hackathon, uh, and I recently had this conversation with a very large organization that runs a a global hackathon for their organization, and it just produces tons of data, um, but that was it. Yeah, and then they have to decide, well, how are all these people doing this thing? And then they had no way of determining what things were a priority of the organization and what teams they would move, nor did they have a means for actually moving people from different parts of the organization. So, you, so I had a team work on one thing and another team work on another. And between them, their ideas were really good. And we want to bring those teams together because that's something that's worth incubating they had no means of moving people within the organization to do that, which, which means um, they tried to transition an idea to another team who basically looked at it. It's like, we don't understand what they do. We don't, what is this? Um, and I see that mistake happen all the time. It, it's that these activities are producing collateral that's not being used um, for the next event. Um, 
but instead it's wasting people's time. People see it as a waste of time. I put all this effort into it and I didn't see anything come out of it. And it creates this condition that we would call innovation exhaustion. And people are just not willing to participate if they see it as a waste of time or a waste of assets. And uh, the one final question then, what, what exactly is BMNT and uh, how, how do you help clients sort of overcome these issues to improve the effectiveness of an innovation pipeline? You, you know, generally, um, our, our golden rule is we don't do things for people. Uh, we actually do it with them with the intent of improving the organizational capacity to apply the innovation pipeline and do things. So generally what happens, first thing we do is go in and do an assessment along the pipeline and, and, and trying to help them look at the activities they're currently doing from the standpoint of what's good, what's not good, and what data we're getting and, and help them show across the organization what, what's actually there that is considered part of the organization's innovation pipeline. And then we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of those and target uh, certain areas for improvement while they're trying to create internally a common language for what that innovation pipeline is going to do. We do that by generating a series of exercises um, that are actually focused on real things for them. So we don't just teach. We actually go in and say, okay, what's the problem we're going to solve that's going to help you get past this blocking point and show you the proper way to do this? And we'll do that repetitively until the organization has actually built their own framework They've trained their own people and actually operating, you know, at 70% capacity on their own. And then we'll step back and do a reassessment for them. And, and we do that repetitively. I yeah. mean, it, it sounds like a lot of uh, companies could benefit from that. If, if people want to find out more about you, BMNT, and the work that you do, what's the best place they can go to find out more? We run a great uh, insights page out of our website. So if you go to bmnt.com, there's a tab up there that says insights. And, and essentially what we do is, is we look at the various um, efforts and activities and um, solutions and problems that, that our clients have come up with. And we essentially write about them. And you'll find probably you know, 20 or 30 articles about specific issues uh, and things that people have done. Uh, you can also find more information about how we approach uh, large organizations and and how we apply uh, the innovation pipeline at H4X, the framework, to actually help them make progress. Fantastic. Pete, it's been wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new you, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.